so, you know, the, the, the title of our, our conversation is uh, Entering Asian Airports Post-Pandemic Era of Unprecedented Digital Transformation, Collaboration, Innovation, and Reimagined Business Models. Uh, a lot of words, uh, basically, uh, I interpret this as, uh, you know, the sky is not the limit in terms of where we see things going in this uh, uh, in the next few years. Um, what I'd like to do is start uh, by talking about uh, the business models uh, of the airport uh, uh, and uh, how, if at all, do they need to be reimagined so that you are providing value to the stakeholders uh, that you serve. Airlines, your concession operators, uh, 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 government, uh, community, and so on. Um, you know, so uh, where, where do we see um, the business model of the airline growing? Obviously, non-aeronautical revenue is critically important, um, but, but uh, what are you focusing on? All right, okay. Up, please. Uh, I think two things fundamentally shifted after pandemic. One, it's uh, like you rightly said, some elements of the business model had to be reimagined. And on the other side, the other thing that we had to also do, change the way we work uh, I think the ways of working had to be sort of reimagined as well. So let's start with the business model. What changed as far as the pandemic was concerned? The first thing that we realized is that when passengers are, uh, when there are no passengers, I think it's, uh, it's the worst situation an airport can face. And therefore, it, we realized that it's extremely important to be uh, really frugal about how we run a business. Uh, number one, make sure that your capacity utilization is there's no question of overbuilding capacity. We need to be as efficient of, uh, about building capacity as possible um, so that it can sort of deal with these kind of uh, uh, shifts in demand. The second thing that we realized is that it's important also to be financially stable. So maintaining adequate cash reserves at all points of time. Uh, and that, that's one of the things, for instance, that helped Bangalore Airport tremendously at the beginning of the pandemic. We had enough cash reserves to last us for the two years, so we didn't have to re resort to knee-jerk reactions to the challenges that we faced during the pandemic. We not only maintained our, all our employees and their salaries, but also paid them their annual bonuses wow. during that period. And that was important to be able to do that. Um, third thing that we realized is that the impact on the pandemic is even on our concessionaires and our partners. How, how is, how, what can we do as airport operators to help that happen, help, help them overcome these kind of fluctuations in demand? So in the recent concessions that we have done, we've taken away the passenger risk from our concessionaires. We've uh, told them that if the demand for air travel falls below 80% of the projected demand, the minimum guaranteed revenue that they have supposed to pay us falls away, right? So that burden on them to pay us month on month, the minimum uh, annual guarantee or the min minimum monthly guarantee is taken away from them and they only pay us a revenue share of the actual revenues made, which I think was a very important step when we opened Terminal 2 because we realized that there was hesitancy on, on, parts of, on the part of concessionaires to come forward just on the back of the pandemic to invest big in a new terminal. The moment we took the risk away, we found a lot of excitement and all, all our partners were willing to make all those commitments back again because they realized that they will not have to deal with the risk of uh, demand fluctuations. Um, and uh, uh, as far as our own ways of working are concerned, we've moved more and more into contactless uh, uh, you know, processing of passengers, so whether it's the biometric travel program, digital payments, across the board, we've adopted a uh, more, let's say, uh, contactless method of travel. And last but not the least, in the design of airports now, in the design of Terminal 2, we've kept as many open floor plates as possible so that in case we have to change layouts uh, to adapt to such sudden requirements, let's say, of screening of passengers and things like that, we have created that flexibility in design as well. So just a few random thoughts from my side. Thanks. Yeah, so, right. yeah. yeah I, I'm going to share the same, you know, I think he already covered 80% of uh, the, the business modeling requirements. Let's add to that the agility, which is the modular base, and build in a very uh, uh, innovation uh, uh, way to the toward best passenger experience. So we discover that the passenger shouldn't walk more than 
50, 100 meter. So that should be the downstream, the upstream, and you, will, you wanna build the hub or the heart of the process in the middle of that, you know, 500 meter in, 500 meter out. So you can have your non-aeronautical area with the best passenger experience and seamless and short uh, distance walking. So rather than you have a very wide terminal with like 100, 1,800 or two, two kilometer of walking distance that we saw it in some airport, now you divide that by two and you put your uh, process area in the middle. So first of all, we said seamless passenger experience, maintaining your non-aeronautical revenue uh, space. The second thing is the modular base. Third, the environmental sustainability. You need to build your business model toward environmental sustainability to assure that you are aligned with the vision of 2030 and 2050 that toward zero carbon you know, emission. And, and last not least, we call it the economy of scale. So you have to operate not only according to the capacity design, you need to op operate according to the economy of scale. Sometimes you have a problem good to have, which is too much uh, volume, bigger than the capacity or larger than the capacity. But you may hit your economy of scale and go for losses if you exceed the design capacity by a huge number that uh, uh, force you to invest more to maintain the passenger experience. So maintaining the economy of scale and that equation always in your mind while you are operating the airport. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to... Uh, build on what you, you've both been talking about in terms of the role that technology plays um, and the points you've made about seamless journeys, uh, effortless journeys. That requires extensive digitalization uh, uh, and, and the use of relevant technologies. The question that I have for all three uh, uh, of you is uh, that as you look at this, uh, and you also factor in some of the new complexities that exist at this point, I'm not sure if we really can say post-pandemic because the virus is out there. It's just not as much of a threat right now and hopefully will never be again. Um, but, but it affects processing time. It affects uh, uh, customer confidence in traveling. It affects what they may be willing or not willing to do in terms of not just travel itself, but dwell time at the airport um, engagement with airport concession operators, use of different facilities, and so on. Uh, you know, and then on top of that, because it's not already complicated enough, we have different generations of travelers. Uh, you have uh, older travelers like me, who is carrying a vintage Pan Am bag, uh, and you've got uh, Gen Z who's coming along who knows nothing about what Pan Am is, but they live fully digitally immersed lives. How do you? Uh, go about trying to find the right balance of this. Sumesh, I'd like to start with you, because I know uh, Sita has done a lot of research around this, um, and you've got your labs where you're also testing things. So would you uh, uh, start us off on this, please? Thanks, Henry. So, so you're absolutely right. So, you know, uh, the digital transformation is key, and, you know, we heard from both of our colleagues, uh, you know, uh, we, we are in a good shape now, and in fact, really looking positive in terms of the growth, uh, not just in our part of the world, but globally. So clearly from our perspective, we see that, uh, you know, the passenger profiles are changing. So firstly, as you said, the Gen Z, uh, they, they want everything digital. They don't want to talk to anyone. They want to walk, have a walkthrough experience as they get to the airport. So how can we have the technology which can support that? And that also goes to say that not just having a walkthrough experience using biometrics as uh, uh, you know, your check-in or a backdrop or going through the gate or going through the lounge, but also looking at, uh, you know, for example, the queue management. So they want that experience through the entire process. So not just while they are boarding and you know, getting to the terminal and boarding the plane, but also you know, when, when they're going through the immigration, when they're doing it the baggage, they're waiting for the cab, how can the technology help to have that seamless experience at every touch point at the airport? Coming back to your second point where you mentioned about, uh, you know, obviously one side is Gen Z, but if you look at it on the other side, on the age of traveler, uh, you know, if, if we looked at between 21 and 22, 
it has gone up by almost about 10 plus uh, points. So, you know, in 2021, uh, the age of travel was, you know, I was about 25, and now it's gone to about 37% in 2022. So that's also really growing. And mainly because they have, uh, you know, more wealth to, to spend on leisure. And when they do that, they are also looking at a different kind of uh, service because they, they're not looking at just technology and a walkthrough experience. But for example, you know, how do you manage uh, the wheelchairs? How do you have the areas to take care of them in terms of like you have a childcare area, how can you have for the, uh, you know, the, the aged passenger? So with that, obviously the technology helps. So for example, you know, you, with the use of 5G and, and you know, with the use of AI, you can actually find out uh, with the passenger and they can request through the mobile or through an agent directly and the wheelchair can come to them. So you know, looking into the future, there are these two type of passenger profiles which you need to take cater for and there would be many more. So the technology what we adopt or what the airports are looking at needs to look at the holistic one to serve each and every passenger going through. But certainly the answer is you know, digitization technology and it, it's there, it's not something which is gonna come after five years or 10 years, it's, it's there now. Digitalization has been at the core of both of your airports evolution. Yeah. You know, what, what have you learned from it and what do you still want to do? So, so let me say something. Thank you, COVID. That's a strange. You know, hard time teach you how to deal with good time. Mm -hmm. And I think during COVID, we dealt as a human being in a surviving mode. So we fight back and we depend on technology. The technology that we don't trust, we become trusting that technology. And that's obvious today. Such an event today is really shared among all over the world, over the technology today, life. So the point here, we start trust the technology that we didn't trust from a security point of view, from a health safety, from a safety point of view, and from an operational point of view. So we have a touchless, zero human intervention in COVID time. So that people are moving with no human intervention because we're trying to protect people from an infection. So having that experience as a human being is a learning curve that's teaching us that we can capitalize on what we have done during COVID and we move forward. So that's first of all. So I think during COVID, even older people, even younger people, they have complied the same thing to protect themselves once it comes to people surviving. Second, I think digitizing is not a goal. It's an enabler. So you need to have the right enablement according to your infrastructure and according to your business operational model. Third, I believe the integration, not only the digitization and the automation is the most important thing out of that digitizing the airport in general. So we have full integrated platform, full automated process, and the digitization would be an enablement as the core or the backbone to carry all that systems and that technology together to assure that we have the best passenger experience. I'm gonna share some, sh something now. I saw it this morning that have been done in Detroit. D Detroit, Detroit, D Detroit. So in that airport, I saw that, that screen. It was just you know, an innovation in technology, but that screen is interacting with each individual separately in the same time. So when I get inside the airport, that screen recognize me saying, hi, Ayman, that's your gate, that's your bath. In the same time, while you're beside me, you see, hi, Henry, and you see that thing, the same screen. So the, my point here, it's not only the digitizing, it's the integration, it's the automation, and we said, the, the whole system work as one integrated platform. Right. I've actually used that. Uh, Ayman is referring to something Delta Airlines is testing at uh, Detroit Metro Airport, uh, where you enter uh, some information, uh, either your, your uh, Delta frequent flyer number uh, or something else about your itinerary. You proceed to a point, and the sign recognizes you. And it can handle multiple people, and it will tell you uh, where your gate is, how far of a walk it is, and some other information. Really is very, very clever. Uh, and it's just the start of, of it's the first iteration of it. Uh, um, uh, you know, so this is actually a good segue to the next thing that I'd like to get your opinions on. What, if any, role does uh, do either AR 
or VR or both play in the future of the airport experience, whether it's for the employee, uh, and that could be uh, uh, inside the terminal or on the ramp or elsewhere, uh, for the traveler, uh, 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 for um, um, a taxi driver, a bus driver, anything else like that. People, you know, what is the role that AR and VR play for the many different types of customers or users you have at airports? So I believe robot, you know, will, will add real value in baggage handling. Interfering with a human being, still today not up to the right level toward best passenger experience. But I believe that the robot today will, 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 will uh, add real value in baggage handling. So rather than you seek for your bag, the bag will come to you according to robot, you know, platform that will be built. And it's already there now when we talk about you know, uh, handling the, the product and delivering the product. So it's the same concept that Walmart and Amazon is doing and others by using that drones and others. So we will have the same thing, but not exactly within the baggage handling and within the, the stuff that belongs to the passenger in general. So that's what I believe now that robot will, will take a place in the upcoming near future to solve and to mitigate and to enhance the passenger, uh, to solve and, and to mitigate some challenges that airport does have and to improve the passenger experience. Harry? Um, I must say that uh, I agree with Amin that wearables today haven't reached the sort of maturity that are required for becoming mainstream. So I don't see right. that being used by passengers too soon. But, but what about these? We have these in you know, our pockets we've, uh, we've tried. wayfinding. I, I agree with you, Henry. Yeah. We find this. I, f I, for one, for instance, if you've got an augmented reality wayfinding solution, we sort of uh, did some beta trials on that. I would find it very odd to see people walking around with their mobiles held like this. Uh, it, it sounds uh, all right in a, let's say, uh, proof of concept setting, but practically speaking, you've got luggage in your hand, you've got other documentation to take care of, and on top of that, holding a mobile phone and walking around, it simply is not the practical way to travel through an airport. You probably will bump into something or have an accident, and I think that's not desirable. On the other hand, uh, uh, I do feel that, especially with wearables, the first application might come when it gets integrated into the asset management platform that I spoke about. Right. I think engineers out on the field repairing something need to refer, let's say, the, the manufacturer's OEM document on, on how to repair it, et cetera, can see that on their wearable as they're repairing something, or even see a video of how to repair it as they're repairing something. That kind of stuff. I think it's value adding because to bring the asset back into operation as quickly as possible has a huge impact. Uh, even for low, you know, low end jobs or jobs that are not bringing that much value, I don't think wearables would make sense because from a cost benefit perspective, I don't think it will make, uh, unless they become more mainstream over a period of time. So maybe in a few years, uh, it might have more application, but for the immediate future, this is the only thing that I can think of. Sumesh, what's, what's Sita's perspective on this from the airport perspective here? So I would say, uh, you know, for, for AI and VR, and, and, you know, I would go even further to metaverse or, you know, uh, digital twin. So th those are the things generally when we look from Sita as man helping with the airport operation enhancement versus the passenger experience, right? The so passenger experience are, you know, nice to have or, you know, it's something sexy and you, you know, you, you wear a, uh, uh, goggles and you say virtual reality, you can have a feel or you can have a game. But where it add re adds really a good value is basically managing the operations, right? So if you can use metaverse, you can use digital twin, try to understand your airport operation, manage the resources really well. So just as an example, right? So for, you know, if you have an aircraft arriving, if, if you can use AI and, and predict that this generally this route takes 30 minutes more, or the aircraft is going to be delayed by 30 minutes, and have uh, you know, information through AI through various different sources. And if you can assign, and if you know proactively that this is going to be 30 minutes delayed, you can then better utilize those resources and say, rather than 100 people going and waiting there, because it's, when the aircraft arrives, it's not just one person. You've got ground handling, you've got baggage, you've got catering, you've got loads and loads of people waiting for it to serve. So if you have, with AI, if you can predict that better and have the resource managed better, then it brings value to the airport. And if I may just quickly add yes, to that, 
digital twin is a possibility that we are very excited about. So for instance, the, the Terminal 2 that we just inaugurated a couple of months ago has been built using a digital twin. The entire design was done on building information modeling. So the digital twin now really opens up a world of opportunities here because to visualize what the building looks like digitally and to be able to uh, uh, manage the asset in that manner uh, opens up a whole world of possibility. And that's where I truly see the application of uh, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and uh, wearables uh, using that. Thanks. So, so it's a smart airport. Let's say, yeah. I, I like to say a smart airport as a living being that interact with the human. So it's not only what we said that's an application or a technology, it's a living building that's smart enough and interact with the passenger according to his situation in general. Thank you. Um, you know, as we think about the digital transformation and the evolution of the airport experience, uh, what, where do you see things with digital border crossing? Uh, you know, IATA has their one ID type of, of initiative out there, but where are we with losing or reducing reliance on paper documents, whether it's a passport, a visa, or anything else, and whether we use biometrics or something else to validate who we are? Um, for those of us who do fly through hubs and do have to clear border crossings on a regular basis, I think we would live for this. Global entry in the US certainly has uh, improved things, but you still have to stop at a kiosk and then stop at a desk and then go on your way. Um, you know, one of the biggest points of friction is international border crossing. And it's not just obviously for people, it's for the cargo that has to be processed as well. Where do you all see the evolution of digital border crossings uh, uh, right now? And what do you think the next five to seven year outlook looks like? I believe now we're, we're, we're in the middle of the journey now. We're not in the beginning of the journey. So especially in a lot of country that they are the, the e-passport, they are the facial, there are, today exist the facial recognition and the digital stamp. So most of us today, when they came and they travel, they didn't stamp their, 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 their passport. They just go for a facial recognition and digital recognition. And as my colleague says, the, uh, the validation of the identity, not getting your personal information. So that validation comes from the government national information center or the, the, the area that the government does have the, 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 the authenticated uh, 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 people uh, information. So you have that an integrated platform for validation and I believe now we are in the middle of the journey and in the upcoming future, I don't think that you will see a lot of immigration point rather than you have just a specific track for special people that they need to be manually or human served, but the rest will go just through that digital path with the pre-check before they came to the airport by the biometric today, we as, 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 as a project that we have it in Saudi Arabia, we have the biometric by the fingerprint when you obtain the visa and goes to the government to let you know that you are allowed or not allowed to come. So you don't need to come and to reach the border and they told you you are prohibited or you are, you are welcome. So pre to that, when you do your biometric through, through your mobile today, you send it, it have been validated yes or no. We don't need to know who you are, but we said this biometric is allowed or not allowed. So my point here is we are there actually, and it's, it's, it's the way to be implemented. So it's about all airport today to implement that technology. So I believe for people movement in general, especially once it comes to the border and the immigration, it's already there. It's about how the airport are accelerating to apply the most advanced services, not the state of the art technology, but the most advanced services fits with the airport passenger profile. Um, Andy, what we're building in India, what we call Digi Yatra, the biometric travel program, is uh, meant to sort of, and Digi Yatra, Yatra means travel. 
So uh, the, the whole idea of building this platform is precisely to ultimately become the single token that enables you to get access through anything. So for example, today, it's being used to get you access into the terminal, to allow you to check in, to pass security, and then board the aircraft. Tomorrow, it could be used practically for anything, because at each of these processes, what is really required is for you to present your travel credentials and your identity validation. That's what even the governments are looking for at border control, and Digiatra ultimately could be used to apply that. We believe that this could be the digital travel stack for India in the future, uh, and not just used for border control, but could be used in other modes of transport, whether it is uh, buses or trains, and it could be ultimately extended across the travel transportation ecosystem, and even ultimately become your, uh, your biometrics could also become the room key in your hotel, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's, the, that's, that's the intention that with which we're building this uh, digital travel stack, and I think it's only a matter of time because before that becomes the way to travel. Let, let me add to this, if you don't mind. Sorry. That's yeah. great. So, yes. Because, you know, I remember something. I'm going to say again, thank you, COVID. Thank you, hard time. During hard time, Saudi Arabia published Tawakkalna, that app. Nowadays, you don't carry any document. You have that app, does have all what you need. Your health passport, your license, your all your property, even your, your, your land property, you know, uh, uh, document. Everything that related to you, it's in one app, and that app is very secured. And it's, it's reliable, and it's authenticated by the court, by the government, by any touch point of a security, or any, any area that you go, you just use that app. So that app is developed today, even to be recognized in the airport for the domestic transportation. So, as, as my colleague says, it's there. It's about the airport today, how to promote that, to have it in reality, to ease and to facilitate passenger movement. So, so, so I would just add uh, to what my colleague said. So, you know, I, I would take it in two parts. The first one, you know, what we learned through COVID. So as you rightly said, you know, IATA had their old travel pass, uh, AOK had a travel pass. So what we did at CETA was to build a platform which can help all of these different health pass schemes to interoperate. Because for you as a passenger, if you're traveling, you know, when, when all of us, those who travel during COVID, we were concerned that the country which we are going to, do we have all the documentation? Although we've got through the first checkpoint, when we arrive, are we okay? What are the documents we need? Even before reaching to the airport, we were not clear what all to carry. So now with that, application and with the health check, you, you can look at one app, irrespective of the country you're going to, whatever, because it interoperates, you have a checklist to say what you look at. So, you know, because of that, the platform is already there. In Touchwood, we don't have COVID anymore, but if we are hit with any of certain uncertainties in the future, you know, the, the, the system and, and the platform is always available. Now, coming back to your second question in terms of the border security, right? So will it be real? Frankly, I feel, uh, you know, it, it, it's a matter of few years. It will be real because every country is currently working on digital identity. And, you know, like Hari explained and Ayman explained, you know, what they're doing in Saudi, having one identity, uh, Digi Athra in India. So governments are already building the systems where they would have these repository and, and the details. The challenge is now the international border. They, there are no standards, right? So how do you have the same standard across the globe? And in fact, ICAO has started this initiative where they are looking at having a standard digital identity, at least for the travel. So once that is in place, then the data is already in place and the countries have implemented in isolation. Now is the question that once we have a standard, which is a global standard of digital identity, then that can be used very easily and integrated with multiple countries. And, you know, and, and just adding on to what Harry and Iman said, it, you know, we have already trialed the entire end-to-end -end journey. So you know, not just the airport. So as a passenger, how can you use your biometrics to, for example, cruise? train, what are you going for, even hotel. And, and then, you know, your digital identity is in your phone, in your handphone, and you can choose that, okay, fine, I've got five touch points in my journey, which one I want to share my data with, so where I want to have a walkthrough experience just using my face, and you can choose that. And, and we've trialed that technology and it, it works. So, you know, from technology perspective, it's only there. The only 
challenges said is in terms of having the standards, global standards, and, and that will come in due course. I'm glad you mentioned the potential ability to use the digital identity with rail or other forms of transportation, hotels and so on, because I'm curious what the role is of intermodal travel uh, at your airports and how you see that evolving. Um, you know, uh, uh, with sustainability focuses, there's sometimes government pressure for fewer short distance flights. At the same time, we've got advanced air mobility coming in. Uh, you know, there's desire for rail or other types of trans uh, ground tra transportation to link nearby communities with airports. Um, where do you guys see intermodal as part of your future? Um, okay, I'll, I'll take that. So I think uh, building the building intermodality or multimodal systems uh, at the at the airport is absolutely the the requirement going forward because today if a passenger is traveling from point A to point B, what the friction comes from making it from one mode of travel to the other in a seamless fashion, really. And, and any mode of travel that you take, or any journey that you take, does involve multiple modes of transport. So at the airport, what we're trying to do, for instance, in, in our recent development, we've also built a multimodal transport hub that brings together, along with the airport, right in front of the airport, the suburban rail link, the metro, the intercity buses, the intracity buses, interstate buses, uh, uh, the app taxis and uh, all the other modes of all the other modes of ground transport together into a single uh, multimodal transport hub. Uh, the idea being that uh, the airport ultimately not should not be a place where only passengers who are flying come, but also who would like to just exchange modes of transport. So somebody from a nearby area could come by bus uh, or by a car to the airport and take an intercity bus to go to another place. The in, in the long run, we don't see us being an airport. We see ourselves to become, uh, becoming slowly a hub of transport. And that's really the aim with which we are developing the master plan of the airport. We're also open to integrating future modes of transport as they come up. So for instance, recently we've uh, launched heli-taxi services between the airport and other parts of the city. The next thing would be to keep ourselves open to drone taxis and any other future mode of transport, including Hyperloop. We hope we also have uh, signed a MOU with Virgin Hyperloop to establish uh, a working group to figure out how we can integrate the Virgin Hyperloop system into the airport in case that was to become a reality in future as well. So we're looking at various modes of transport to see how they can be integrated because airports will not be just airports in the future but will be really uh, hubs of transport. I, I totally agree and at the same time, I'm gonna refer to what we will ask me Last question when we've been in previous session, when you ask me about my relation with Saudi airline. So I believe the airport is half of the puzzle. Where the A, we are the land base, we are the hub. Right. But the other half, it's the airline. So the integration with the airline will help us to offer one ticket toward all passenger journey since he left his home until he reached the destination, whether it's transit or, or uh, tourism or uh, for Hajj or Umrah or uh, for point to point. So the integration with the airline is one of the key success factor that you need to rely on to assure that you are offering one ticket that does have all the services. No matter what you provide as an airport, the airline is one of the major key success factor to assure that integration in the same time to assure that you have this as end-to-end -end ticket, not only for the trip from point A to point B. You know, sustainability is obviously very important. We have discussed this in, in our prep calls and you are all, your organizations are all very focused on sustainability. Um, share with me, and I'm, Sumesh, I'm gonna ask you to start us off uh, with uh, how you see whether it's technology helping uh, here or partnerships or something else uh, so that uh, airports are able to fulfill their uh, role in helping to make air travel, uh, air cargo shipping, and more, uh, more sustainable in meeting the objectives that we, we want to meet. 
So, so I would say I would start with saying that, you know, personally for us as CETA, uh, we are certified carbon neutral company, right? So we will have to start with that. The second, uh, you know, the solutions of what we build for the air transport industry it needs to be sustainable, right? So how can we help them reduce the carbon footprint? So we really focus a, a lot on that. And finally, coming to the third point in terms of saying at, at the airport itself, we do have technologies and, and you know, we, we build technologies which can help track uh, airports in terms of what their carbon footprint is, which are the areas where they can have, uh, you, you know, uh, a more uh, balanced approach where they can say, because if you look at, you know, most part of, even for the airport, it's aircraft, right? So basically the aircraft emissions are also one of the bigger uh, contributor to carbon emissions. So we w not only work with the airports, but also with the airlines. So what airlines should do, and for example, the optic line, we have a solution with the airline, we can save, uh, you know, just for example, Singapore Airlines can save 15,000 tons of carbon uh, per year just on the 350 fleet. So that, that shows, so, you know, when the aircraft is taking off from the airport, what climate should take. So this, there are many solutions that can help. So one, the solutions directly helping to reduce the carbon footprint, and two, the solutions basically to track and give a recommendation to say what it is, uh, you know, where you can reduce and have optimization, be it energy, be it your technology, your servers, hardware, your core room, where you can save that. So certainly there's a technology. So there are two areas which we work with. One on airport itself, and two, working with the other stakeholders at the airport. So how can they have a better technology? So for example, electric cars, right? So if they're electric cars, how can the technology help to manage that well? So once you have the car, how can you have a technology uh, to, to help them be at the right place, you use 5G technology to say how you can deploy it to the right place when they can go back to the charging station. So those technologies, we certainly have to help the airport uh, to deploy and reduce and manage uh, the carbon footprint. So huh? sustainability is most likely, I can say it in several elements. First of all, the financial sustainability. We have to build our business model in recurring and the new recurring. We should avoid the hit and run and the high peaks. You couldn't depend on high peaks, but I could depend on a seasonality that I forecast and it considered part of my recurring. So reaching the economy of a scale from generating the right revenue, maintaining and utilizing the asset, optimizing the operation, in the same time, making the right profit and making the right reserve in order to assure that you secure the future. And you can catch any opportunity with that right reserve in order to hit the, the goal of a growth that you have. Second, the environmental sustainability, which means zero carbon emission by 2050, as Saudi Arabia is mentioned, and we are targeting to finalize ACA1, ACA2. Already we have some airport achieved ACA1 and ACA2, so we call, we call it zero carbon emission goal that we need to reach by promoting more electric machinery rather than we have the fuel now. And the dependency will go furthermore to depend on uh, uh, electric machinery coming from the pushback, the stirs, the, all the ground handling material that is, is today could be done by, by, by uh, uh, electrics. And having the right partnership with the alternative power provider, not to have it only with the current you know, fuel uh, uh, provider, you need to build a new partnership and new, a new power farm rather than the fuel farm that we have in our airport that make huge risk of, of, uh, for the environment as well as for our uh, operational sustainability. Last not least, we said the, uh, the waste control, the zero, you know, or let's say paperless, as much as we can that we have zero waste and we have the best waste control that will help us to assure that we have the right uh, sustainability model in general by the right digitization and integration and uh, 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 fully integrated platform with the right, you know, uh, 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 operational uh, seamless uh, uh, passenger uh, movement in general. Thanks. Harry, uh, my view is that sustainability has stopped being something special that we do outside our business. It's simply a hygiene factor. Uh, you've just got to build it into your ecosystem because no development and progress can be called that unless it's sustainable in the first place, right? And uh, therefore, we've sort of 
embraced the philosophy from the time we've opened the airport. And over a period of time, we have uh, undertaken several measures to ensure that the sustainability of our business is uh, established for the long run. So financial sustainability, including all the changes that we had to make to our business model, we spoke about a few minutes back, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But the, on, on environmental sustainability alone, I think we're, we've done reasonably well so far. Uh, we've set ourselves the goal to become net zero by 2030, but my sense is that we'll achieve, to th achieve that by 2028. And when I say net zero for scope one and scope two emissions, for an airport to achieve that for scope three emissions, is uh, a, a, li a little too ambitious. So I would say scope one and scope two uh, uh, emissions. And scope three emissions, we have also signatories uh, to a sustainability, a sustainable aviation fuel, uh, uh, let's say, experiment to see whether we can establish uh, and slowly scale up our use of sustainable aviation fuel. Without sustainable aviation fuel, there is no chance of achieving net zero on scope three emissions. On the other hand, across the campus, what's in our control, I think we have done well. Across the campus, not just for the aviation needs, but including for all the non-aviation needs, including the offices, the uh, hotels, and every single business that exists on our 4,000-acre campus, we are powered 100% only through renewable energy. We don't use any fossil fuel across the campus. So that is a big step already from, because from an energy standpoint, we're already neutral. 75% of all our energy needs come from solar, 25% from wind. Uh, secondly, the airport was established in a rain shadow area where water was already depleted. So we focused a lot on achieving water uh, sustainability. And in the last 10 years, the program that we've put together for uh, rainwater harvesting and reuse has resulted in us being certified as water positive. So we have been certified with, with a water positivity index of 1.37, which means for every liter of water we consume, we produce, conserve, and reuse 1.37 liters of uh, water. Um, from a, a waste management standpoint, we are, um, we've established a state-of-the-art waste management facility at the airport, which ensures zero discharge to landfill. We've eliminated single-use plastic across the campus, for which we've just received a uh, commendation from ACI. We are uh, level four plus, ACI level four plus carbon neutral certified. Uh, Terminal two is the largest airport of its, uh, uh, is the largest airport in the world and the second one outside the United States to be uh, lead platinum certified for a new airport development. Uh, we use, uh, I, I think the energy efficiency that uh, Terminal two offers is, is the best in class and so on and so forth. So, this is just woven into the fab fabric of our existence, and sustainability, therefore, is not something that we separately focus on. It's just hygiene factor, I would say. Gentlemen, I want to thank you. I wish we had more time. I've got more questions to ask, but we don't have more time for them. Um, thank you, Sumesh, Hari, Ayman, for your wonderful perspectives uh, and insights. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, uh, joining us this morning. Um, we are now going to take a break until 11.20 a.m. Uh, when the uh, next track sessions will begin. Uh, so thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed it. Please join me in thanking our terrific panelists. Thank you.